The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those on the West Coast. My name is Richard Garrett. I am the North America Director for iGraduate, the company behind the International Student Barometer, the subject for today's webinar. Let me walk you through what we're going to cover today, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to go over a number of things. I want to give you some background and some fundamentals on the ISB, the International Student Barometer, I'll focus today. Then think about the context for Canadian colleges specifically. That's our focus group for this webinar. And then to wrap all that up into some three statements about our sense of the value of the ISB for a Canadian college at this point in time. I then want to introduce two other voices to the call, two peer institutions, two colleges that have worked with us for a number of years who have administered the International Student Barometer. Centennial College in Ontario, a large institution in the college sector, and then the College of the Rockies in British Columbia, a much smaller institution, both of which have found uh, the ISB to be very valuable. And uh, later on, I'll introduce representatives from each institution uh, from their international divisions. We're including those to provide you with a direct peer perspective on why adopt the ISP, how does it work, how is it valuable over time. Then we will turn to some of what I've termed here ISP big data. The ISP has been running for a number of years, as you'll see. It's collected a vast trove of information across huge numbers of institutions, countries, students, years. And as a result, this is a unique archive of data that can play a very helpful role in trying to tease out what does a strong, world-class even, international student experience look like? And how can we marry this kind of quantitative data to the more typical qualitative, experiential, on the ground kind of intelligence that international higher education is known for in North America generally and around the world. Now, I do encourage you to pose questions during this webinar uh, as they occur to you. You can use the chat function in the control panel at the bottom on the right hand side of your screen. If those are simple questions, uh, one of my colleagues will answer them immediately. If they're questions of a more detailed nature or to one of the panelists, then uh, we will get to them at the appropriate point in time. This webinar is being recorded, so if there are colleagues who would like to hear it and couldn't join us today, then let us know and we'd be happy to share a link. So let's start with the basics of the ISB. What is iGraduate? What is the International Student Barometer? How does it work? iGraduate is a UK company. It's about 10 years old. And the ISB is one of a number of products, but is the flagship, the original, and remains the largest product. The original rationale for iGraduate was to move from a situation where each institution might run its own surveys of international students in terms of satisfaction and experience. Different departments might run them. They might be run in one year, but not another year. But there was essentially no means for a single institution to get perspective from outside in terms of how their particular results compared to peer schools, to a national benchmark, and to a global benchmark. The ISB addressed that gap and took off pretty rapidly and has been now used, as you can see, by hundreds of universities, colleges, English language ent entities, other kinds of post-secondary institution all over the world. And we've accumulated well over 1.5 million unique student records. As you can see from this diagram, increasingly we're applying the same logic to other bodies within higher education, prospective students, alumni, but the same logic applies. Rather than solely relying on internal surveys, moving to an external benchmark to complement the internal perspective. But today we're going to focus on the ISB. 
And just before I do that, I just want to mention that iGraduate is now part itself of a larger entity. Tribal Group, again a UK firm but increasingly international, uh, a large technology and education services firm focused solely on the education sector from the compulsory sector through the college and university sector through the vocational and training sectors. I won't go into details here, but just be aware that I graduate is part of a bigger entity and there's all kinds of potential for cross-referencing between different software solutions such as our student information system, learning management systems, some of which are dedicated to the college sector, and the kind of intelligence you get out of iGraduate and the ISB. Now, let's turn to the ISB specifically. Let me just give you some parameters in terms of how it works, what it covers, and so forth. The core questionnaire is a satisfaction survey with four main sections. The arrival experience for new international students, the learning experience in and around the classroom, the living experience beyond the classroom, and then support services, both those dedicated to international students and those more generally. We also ask the ultimate recommendation question. Would you recommend to a compatriot that they attend this institution if they're considering studying abroad? And we also ask about the decision of the institution and the country, the application process, did the student use an agent, and if so, what do they think of that service? And there are also some student engagement questions as well. The survey is obviously semi-standardized to permit comparability across institutions and over time, but we do customize by country, certain standard terminology say, and also by institution. If you call a particular service by a particular name, that's obviously the name we want to use in the survey, so your students recognize it. The survey covers undergraduate and graduate students, less of an issue for the college sector, but certainly a number of colleges do have non-degree graduate students, and some of those are international. And it also covers all years of study. And the survey is administered each fall, and in a window between roughly October and December, of the school's choosing and the surveys normally in the field for two, three, four weeks. The typical response rate on a survey is around 30 percent, which is pretty high. In our experience, international students very much welcome a survey dedicated to them as opposed to a survey that may include them but typically prioritizes the domestic student. To give you a sense of scale, last fall, 2013, for degree-granting institutions, so excluding some other institutions that we work with, for degree-granting institutions across about 180 of those across 13 countries, we achieved about 145,000 unique international students. As I've emphasized, this is by far the largest survey of its kind in the world. Institution-specific results are then compared against a custom peer group, however you might want to categorize that as an individual institution, and then a standard against a national benchmark or a national college benchmark in this case, and then against an international benchmark and also an international college benchmark. Each institution gets a customized report typically delivered in person and that can be a combination of a large group inviting representatives from colleges and schools within an institution and also service units. And then it can also include a smaller group dialogue about the implications of the results and where an institution might prioritize in terms of reform, change, improvement. It goes without saying that the results are confidential to each institution each participating institution forms part of a benchmark and a series of rankings, but no institution is identified by name when tied to a particular position on a ranking. Now, let me just give you a quick sense of the subcategories beneath those four main headings on the survey, arrival, learning, living, and support, just to give you a sense of what the survey covers. 
Under learning, we cover everything from aspects of the instructional experience, including assessment methods, supporting facilities and technologies, the intersection between academics and the workplace, and aspects of English language, both in terms of the students' ability to speak English and also faculty members' English, if it's not a native language. Under living, we cover everything from accommodation, safety, integration with both domestic students and other international students and with the broader culture, sports facilities, social facilities, technology, worship facilities, transportation and various aspects of financial support, earning money. Under support, these are, uh, these are the generic titles and by the way all these are shorthand for the wording that would actually be in the survey questions questionnaire but customized by each institution we will again ask about food and drink on campus housing technology healthcare career support student union international office faith provision and then under arrival and these questions are typically only posed to students newly arrived each fall or thereabouts. We ask about the welcome and pickup experience at point of arrival, the airport, the railway station, whatever it might be, initial registration, orientation experience, the first night experience, initial access to technology, access to bank account, early integration with domestic and other students, early interaction with staff and initial coherence of program of study. On all these items, students rate their satisfaction on a standard scale and we can then dissect the results by nationality, by college or academic department, year of study, so on. This slide simply gives you an overview of the kinds of reporting that you get as a participating institution. As I mentioned, there's a in-person, typically, presentation that provides an overview of the data and tries to interpret what's going on, give the school a clear sense of the meaning, the implications, rather than simply the data in isolation. But inevitably, there's a lot of detail that we can't cover in a single session. So to enable a school to delve into that, we provide supporting Excel files with built-in pivot table function functionality to allow a school to call out a particular academic department or field of study or nationality or whatever it might be and compare that group to the national, uh, to the institutional norm or some other benchmark. And in the last couple of years, we've added a software tool to support that same aim, interact our data visualization software built on the Tableau platform that in a very user-friendly, intuitive way allows an institution to go in, change the benchmark, look at a particular subgroup, look at a particular set of questions, and go beyond the overview presentation that was provided uh, by our graduate. In addition to providing overall satisfaction in quantitative terms, students are also invited to provide supporting comments to add color to why they are, they are satisfied or dissatisfied in relative terms. We offer a flavor of those to support particular observations in the data, but there's a lot more detail there, and each comment, while anonymized, is tied to a particular academic department, a particular field of study, and a nationality. So you can again see patterns that may go beyond the initial analysis that we provided. Now today our focus is obviously Canadian colleges and we're very pleased to work with a number of such institutions already and you can see a selection here. There's quite a range by geography. We have a core group in Ontario that we work with. 
but also you can see colleges on the west coast and the east coast and you can see institutions that are both large for this sector such as uh, George Brown, Humber, Seneca but also some much smaller colleges like College of the Rockies, one of our panelists today, and also College of uh, New Caledonia. The whole point of this webinar is that participation in the ISB is that much more helpful when there's a robust peer group to benchmark against. We already have that to a significant extent in Canada in the college sector, but there's clearly many colleges we don't work with and many colleges that are increasingly serious about international student recruitment that we don't work with. So we're running webinars like this focused on particular peer groups to raise awareness of the tool, to emphasize the value of peer participation, and to help our existing clients gain more value over time. So the point of this webinar is to surface institutions that are active in terms of international student recruitment, are in the process of growing often quite rapidly, their international student numbers, and would welcome perspective on their international student experience, international student satisfaction. Are they reassuringly average compared to peers? Are they ahead? And they might use that to their advantage in marketing terms. Or are they actually behind in some key areas? Why is that? Can it be easily explained in terms of the demographics of the institution? Or is it more complex? But in our view, without that kind of external perspective on the international student experience, it's hard for a single institution to really know how to evaluate performance to date. You might, in fact, be much stronger or much weaker than you otherwise realize without this kind of external, consistent benchmarking. Now, with that introduction, I want to make some uh, brief remarks about the context in Canada, and specifically in the, in the college sector, and then conclude with some comments about the value of the ISB given that context. Now, it's no surprise that data on, well, the cross-country data on international student recruitment among colleges as opposed to universities is particularly fraught with gaps and data and definitional issues and inconsistencies. But using some OECD data, I pulled together this chart and I think it provides a number of pointers on the college sector when it comes to international students. So let me just explain what this chart is showing. As I'm sure you're all aware, the OECD puts out an annual education at a glance report that provides notional comparability across OECD and other countries in terms of a wide range of education variables. And at the tertiary level, higher education level, there's a basic distinction between type A programs, which are more traditional academic oriented, so essentially bachelor's degree and above, and then type B, which is essentially two-year, what might be called an associate degree in some countries, a foundation degree, certificates, diplomas at the undergraduate level, notionally a more vocational, notionally a more standalone award. Obviously, there are blurred lines between these, and different countries count them in different ways, whatever the OECD might, might say to the contrary. But for what it's worth, this chart contrasts data reported by national governments to the OECD focused on institutions that are, I would argue, essentially of the character of Canadian colleges, the kind of colleges I showed on that earlier slide, that primarily focused on this type B award. This is showing the absolute number of international students by sector for those countries, and then the proportion of all type B students in those countries that are international. And I want to make a couple of observations here. So certainly in absolute terms, the college sector runs quite far behind the university sector in most countries in terms of international students. Prospective university students tend to be better off. There tends to be more of a tradition of the best and brightest studying abroad. There seems to be more of a clear ROI traditionally for the university sector. But I think 
that's rapidly beginning to change. I think by definition, the more, the larger the larger demand for international study becomes at tertiary level, the more diverse the prospective international student becomes, the more like the breadth of institutions and the breadth of students we see at the domestic level, the international sector will similarly start to resemble that. And colleges, I think, are increasingly well placed compared to many of the to many universities to meet the needs of the international student in terms of coming from a different academic setting, language challenges. So I think while some of these numbers are quite small, some of these ratios are quite small, tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands, say, that we see at the higher education level in some countries, I think we could argue that the college sector is at the beginnings of significant expansion when it comes to international enrollment. So let me just point to a couple of contrasts. So Canada, you can see there, this is OECD, OECD data from 2011 or 2010 or so, the most recent we have that's, that's cross-country. We know these numbers have typically grown since 2011, but just for comparability's sake, so Canada, just under 40,000 international students reported for the college sector in that year, which was a little over 5% of all students of that type. Then you see a couple of contrasts. You see Australia and New Zealand out to the right-hand side, comparable numbers of international students. These are smaller countries, certainly New Zealand, much smaller than Canada, but more intense recruitment of international students at the, at the college level. Lower than the university level, but far above the OECD average at the college level and far above Canada. So those two countries show what's possible in terms of growth and arguably where Canada is trying to get to. When we think about the ACCC, their goal to double international enrollment in the coming years. Then the other contrast I would make is the USA, by far the largest number of international students at college level, but in proportional terms, a sleeping giant, as I've phrased it here. Uh, the US college sector, with some institutional exceptions, really hasn't embraced international enrollment. And actually, in recent years, international enrollment in the US college sector has actually gone down in absolute terms, as well as proportional terms. That could change if the US paid more attention to this market at the college level as it's begun to do at university level. That could make a big difference to the visibility of that sector and competition from that sector. And the market will perhaps be less open to the uh, entrepreneurship of the likes of Australia and New Zealand and to a relative extent Canada. So I think Canada is very well placed to take advantage of a more diverse international student demand. Australia and New Zealand show what's possible, but there's also major markets, particularly the US major sectors, uh, that really haven't played a significant role yet. So lots of opportunity, lots of potential, and I would argue all the more reason that the ISB is a useful tool in that context. So before we turn to our two panelists, let me just make three observations. Uh, I would argue that the ISB represents something of a solution to three core challenges facing Canadian college international divisions today. First challenge, I would argue, is the attendant risk of an emphasis on revenue over experience. At many, not all, but at many schools, recent interest in growing the international student population is driven by a combination of public funding in retreat, weaker domestic demand following the Great Recession, and the risk is that international demand seems endless, there seems to be perhaps a weak feedback loop between experience for enrolled students and then demand and decision making for prospective students. And as a result, institutions can find themselves in a situation where enrollment is relatively easy, demand is very, very strong, but trying to do more with less, efficiency gains, cross-subsidy, there's a risk that the international student experience can actually suffer scale becomes a net negative. The international student population may be overly dominated by one nationality, and as we'll see later, that's certainly the case at a number of our existing Canadian partners. How can the ISB help? 
I would argue that as an external comparative perspective on what's working well at a college in terms of the international student experience and what's working less well, the results from the ISB can be a very useful tool to help make the case for change. Most institutions, for most students, there's broad basic satisfaction. There's no big crisis that we tend to find at most institutions. But equally, there's few, there's few students who say they're very satisfied, few who would unequivocally recommend the institution. There's a growing sense of choice across institutions, across countries, for a prospective international student. So I think any college would be wise to avoid complacency here, to avoid the assumption that demand will be infinite, we can take as many students as we wish, and we don't really need to think too hard about their experience. Clearly, the more satisfied the international student body is today, the more substantive claims an institution can make about why it stands out in an otherwise crowded market. That can help lower marketing costs, improve conversion rates, can build a more engaged, generous alumni beyond domestic students, and can take what might otherwise be a provincial institution, not widely known outside the country, to an institution that can develop a brand precisely because it has invested in the international student experience in an above average way and can stand upon that and gain visibility that conventional rankings, conventional marketing simply might not provide. Secondly, I'd say that regardless of country, the business of recruiting and serving international students benefits very much from strong professional networks. So in Canada, CBIE, for example, there's lots of small-scale studies in the literature, specialist journals, looking at the nature of the international student experience. But I would argue there's a genuine gap when it comes to what we might call big data, quantitative, cross-institutional, cross-country, longitudinal data of the kind represented by the ISB. And I would argue in the kind of growth environment that we see in higher education generally when it comes to international students and the Canadian college sector is no exception, I would argue that the professional networks, the small-scale studies, the local intelligence, that's essential, but it reflects a world of smaller scale, smaller numbers, more modest growth targets, less competition, less choice, and I would argue that the kind of big data represented by the ISB is a very useful complement to those other resources and perspectives. And I would argue that without the kind of, again, cross-institutional, cross-country, longitudinal data represented by the ISB, it's very hard to really stand back and say, well, how can we distinguish between anecdote and data, between opinion and data? We need all of those things. But I would argue in this highly charged growth environment, the addition of the ISB adds a very useful tool to the toolbox. Final challenge, everyone accepts that internationalization on campus represents a host of benefits beyond revenue. But equally, as I phrased it here, the power of internationalization is hard to wield. There are things an institution can put in place in terms of policies, staff, resources, but equally there's a lot that goes into an internationalized campus or an internationalized experience that is out of the control of the institution. It's in the hands of the students, both international and domestic, and in terms of the surrounding area, the surrounding population. Clearly, a truly internationalized campus is much more than enrolling students and taking advantage of, of buoyant demand that we see today. There's no simple answer to that. The ISB is obviously no silver bullet here, but I do think it's an excellent way of gauging distance traveled, the gap between we've, got, we've gone as an institution from a handful of international students to a few hundred, from 1% to 5% to 10% of the student body, 
that, that's a significant trajectory. And then thinking about what our international student experience starts out looking like versus how can we steadily, incrementally over time address weak points, learn from other institutions, and really start to manifest this internationalization notion, recognizing it's not a one-size-fits-all arrangement, it's dynamic, it's going to evolve over time, it'll be particular to each institution, but I really think it offers a lot of potential for evolving what it means to be a student at a certain institution, both on the domestic side and the international student side. And the ISP, insofar as it represents some common metrics for success, not the only metrics, but I think relevant, useful metrics, enables a school to really track over time distance traveled, improvements made, innovation needed. So just before I turn to our two panelists for their perspective, I just want to emphasize the range of performance we do see on the ISB. This slide focuses on the recommendation question. Would you, as an international student, having experienced this particular institution in this country, would you recommend that to a compatriot considering something similar? It's a five-point scale question, and this particular chart highlights the ratios for the top two options, what we call active ambassadors, international students who say, unequivocally, I would recommend this institution, and I will be an active ambassador. I will go out of my way to promote this institution when I'm conscious of friends, family, acquaintances, thinking about studying abroad. That's what institutions want. That represents a truly engaged alumni. It represents a valuable source of word of mouth and referrals, and also represents a way of controlling marketing costs that can otherwise seem mysterious or, or ineffective. Second best option is passively positive. That's where the student says, yes, essentially, I would recommend this institution, but there are reasons why I'm not going to give it that top mark. I'm not going to say, I'm going to go out of my way to say nice things. But if I'm asked, yes, I will, I will be positive. But what I want to emphasize here is the range for that dark green, that active ambassador portion. The best performing institutions on our survey around the world, over 50% of international students put themselves in that active ambassador category. The weakest, it's barely double digits. So the question really is, how can we explain this range? Why is it that certain schools can get 50% top recommendation and others nowhere near that? Once we've spoken to our panelists, I'm going to show you some example analysis that we've done that seeks to explain ranges like this. It can't explain everything. This is far too complex a territory, far too many variables to come up with a simple cause and effect. But does seem to explain a significant proportion of the variation. But I'm showing you this chart simply to point out that there is very wide range across the institutions that we deal with. Not every institution is, is essentially the same. The experience does vary. The reaction to the experience does vary. And then all the implications that stem from that range. So enough from me. Let me now turn to our two peer institutions. Very pleased to welcome, we have Virginia Machiavello, who is Director of International Education at Centennial College in Ontario. And then we have Jeff Cooper, who is Manager of International Education at College of the Rockies in British Columbia. As I've said, both institutions have worked with us for uh, a number of years. And I really wanted you to hear directly from them as to why get involved in the ISB progress, logistics to date, plans for the future. So uh, Virginia and Jeff, welcome. Virginia, if I could start with you, if you could just give us a quick sense of the scale and scope of international students at Centennial and then the rationale for getting involved with the ISB. Certainly. Uh, uh, good day and happy, happy to be here and to chat with you about our experience with ISB. Uh, at Centennial College, we have uh, close to 5,000 international students from 104 countries. And we have uh, increased our target uh, for international students 
by about 8% each year. So just to give you uh, a sense of the growth and uh, where we started and, and where we're at right now. When we first started, uh, we basically had students from two sending countries, India and China. So we have um, uh, been able to diversify our international population. And ISB has been a tool for us to look at that international uh, population uh, going forward. So I'd like to say that there are basically three things that we use the ISB for. First of all, from a recruitment standpoint, uh, the ISB allows us to drill down by country. And so we can look at not only corporately how we're doing or what's important to international students, but we can also look at it by the sending country. So we can look at what's important and who are the influencers on making those decisions by country. And uh, so that allows us to be much more strategic about our recruitment. Uh, of course, there, this is one of the tools that we use. We use many tools, but it is an important tool for us to analyze and look at what's important, who is making, uh, who are the influencers for those students making those choices. Is it, is it the agents? Is it the parents? Yeah, are the students independent? And so that's very useful to us. And, and then we can look at where we're, we're spending our marketing dollars. So recruitment is, is one side of it. And, and, and just to, to say to you, there are very distinct differences between sending countries. So the second area that we use it for is uh, in, in the experience, the international student experience at our college. And we, again, do that by, by country. So while we're interested, uh, we certainly uh, uh, have our corporate people do an analysis by program for the academic areas, but from an international point of view, uh, we are interested in our services to international students and their experiences. So uh, it, it has been extremely useful to us in improving, and we actually use that information to decide what kind of services we need to spend our money on. And one of the things that we found out was that we're not always spending uh, our money on things that are important to students. We were spending it on what we thought was important. So the tool has been useful for us to decide uh, how to spend uh, the money. And we're all, uh, none of us have uh, open bank accounts with bottomless pits of money. So it, it has been useful for us to be more strategic about where we spend our money. And the third area that I would share with you is we use it as our um, measurement of our success. So uh, both for recruitment and marketing as well as the academic areas and their schools and the experience as well as our international department, we use it as our measurement in our business plan and in our performance. So we can look at uh, accountability in within our departments for international students. So I guess that's a summary. Um, if you have any questions, be ha happy to answer them for you. But it has been a really useful strategic tool for us and uh, uh, would recommend it to you. Thanks, Regina. I, I will come back to you with some questions. But let me ask the same question of Jeff first. College of the Rockies, a very different institution, very different setting, different scale. Tell us how, how the International Student Barometer came to the college and how you've begun to use it. Thanks, Richard, and uh, thanks also for, for inviting me to speak uh, on behalf of College of the Rockies. And hello and welcome to everyone. Um, it, indeed, in terms of scale and scope of institutions, we're just about polar opposite of Centennial in terms of numbers. Um, compared to their 5,000 international students from 104 countries, we have um, about half that many total students. And uh, at any given semester, between 150 and 200 international students uh, from around 35 countries. So uh, just about polar opposite in terms of scale. Um, however, similar to a lot of the things Virginia mentioned, we, we have also found the ISB uh, tool to be useful in a number of different ways. Um, 
the, the rationale for getting involved initially came through our executive director, Patricia Bullard, who had been in, in discussions with iGraduate. Um, and we were finally at a point financially, um, because it, as a smaller institution, obviously our revenues are a lot lower, so um, the cost to participate was a, was a significant factor for us, but made the decision that it was um, an important investment take a closer look um, in comparison to other institutions about how we are doing, because we do put the international uh, satisfaction of, of our students very, very highly, um, and we know that word of mouth as a smaller institution is, uh, is critical for us, as it is for all institutions. And so the decision was made a few years ago to go ahead and invest that, um, that money, and, and so we have now participated for, uh, for, for two years. And that, that's how, that was our rationale for getting involved. And, and we have learned a number of um, important things that have come out of our involvement in the survey over the past couple of years. So, so Jeff, staying, staying with you, give, me, give, give us some examples of things that you learned that you didn't expect or things that confirmed what everyone knew anecdotally, but some solid data really made a difference. Sure. Um, well, well, I guess the first thing we hadn't expect was was to do so was to do so well. Uh, for two years in a row, we ranked um, very, very highly overall, as well as within each of the uh, the four categories that you mentioned: learning, living, support, and arrival, and within individual subcategories. Um, so we had hoped to be, you know, above the, the median, but certainly hadn't expected to come out um, as highly as we did, right, right on top. Now, part of the reason for that, I think, is because with the I don't know for the institution with the smallest number of international students that's involved with ISD, but we're certainly among the smaller institutions. So probably as a, as a result of having a smaller number of students, perhaps we um, are better able to provide individual service to those students. Um, now, of course, having said that, there were certain categories where we did not rank at the top and, and certainly well below the median. One example, I'll give you two examples. One of them is in transportation. College of the Rockies is located in Cranbrook, BC, which is in the southeast corner of British Columbia. Uh, the closest large centers would be Calgary, which is uh, uh, more than a four-hour drive away um, or, or uh, you know, close to an hour flight. Um, so we weren't surprised by that, and we're limited in terms of what we can do for transportation. We do have uh, local city transit here, but it stops around 6 p.m. There's less than 20,000 people within the city of Cranbrook. Um, and then to get anywhere, there's large distances. So unless students have their own vehicle, that presents challenges. Now, having said that, um, one of the areas when we saw that come up was that for the first time this fall, we're going to invite uh, someone from the city of Cranbrook uh, Transportation to come and speak to our students and talk about the bus transportation system um, and what's possible. And there is after-hours service um, that can be arranged and is used. So, so there, we're, we're trying to do as much as we can with that data that came specifically out of it. Another one is, um, uh, you had mentioned earlier about worship facilities. Uh, for example, having a prayer room. We, we do not have that, but it was an area that came out um, where we didn't rank very highly. And again, having smaller student numbers, it's not a hugely significant factor for most of our students but it is for some of our students. And so as a result of that, we're looking at ways where we um, can work with our facilities department to, um, to perhaps put something in place um, for those students who do want that kind of service. Virginia, going back to you, you, you referenced, uh, some, similar to Jeff, certain aspects of the experience emerge as very, very strong, others very weak, changes then made. Can you give us a concrete example or two so people understand the kinds of insights that emerge from the ISB? Yeah, uh, for example, uh, we found that, um, let, let me sort of look at the, the sending countries from a recruitment point of view. Uh, we found that, for example, in China, uh, the, the parents and agents were, uh, were predictors of, or influencers for for our recruitment, and um, so that was very important to them to, to work through agents. While in South Korea, uh, it was it was quite different. Uh, as far as services on campus, uh, we found even within the different uh, 
sending countries, there were, there were different things that were important to them. Uh, often the Chinese students were looking for a pathway to university. Uh, they weren't that concerned about working uh, during or after uh, they graduated from our institutions. While in India, it was very important and in, in, in Latin-speaking countries. So from the international department, those became very, uh, the work experience became a very different voice depending on the country. And we were able to drill down to the country. So that was important. Uh, on, on services, uh, host, uh, connecting with their host uh, country students was important with some groups, while uh, in other groups it was connecting with uh, Canadian students. Uh, and and we, were be able, we were able to analyze that. Uh, the importance by uh, the, the, the information it gave to us by actual programs was also interesting because we were able to uh, talk to the deans and the schools about the area, their strengths and their weaknesses and the possibilities for improvement for the student experience. And we were able to set up programs uh, and support services for the international students based on those uh, on those things, and and so it was really important to us uh, to be able to drill down by country, by program, uh, and uh, understand the differences between the different uh, countries on campus, and that really helped us with our diversification of international students because we were looking to uh, manage the risk of having so many students from only two countries. And so we now have 30 countries uh, with students over, over triple uh, digit numbers, which was uh, really important to us. And as we all know, with the political situation as it is, you don't want to have your international students coming from any particular country. So it was useful to us in, on many levels, multiple levels. Thank you. And, and Jeff, going back to you, you, you referenced the fact that College of the Rockies did particularly well and small size may be part of that. Uh, and I'll actually show some data in a moment that, that supports that view in, 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 a, in a more general sense. But I know because you did so well, uh, your example of you know, any institution that does particularly well on the survey tends to then see the marketing benefit of that success. Could you just give a sense of the kinds of things you've done with the fact that you've ranked so highly uh, in terms of folding that into your marketing for international recruitment? Yeah, it, it certainly wasn't the primary reason that we got involved with ISP initially, but, but having the, the strong results, we certainly um, wanted to take advantage of that as much as we can. and. Of course, then the next challenge is, well, you know, limited resources, limited budget. How, how do we get the message out? So um, certainly updating our, um, our, our web page and putting information front and center about, uh, about our high-ranking um, marketing materials that we, that we use at, at all of the education fairs. Um, now, now another sort of offshoot of that, that that we're trying to do and working directly with our um, marketing department here is We've actually committed some funds to put towards domestic marketing. Um, so we're, we're trying within the international department to not only market it, um, first and foremost to market it internationally to, to increase our international student numbers, but we're actually um, providing um, support to our domestic uh, departments because a lot of the students, more than half, probably 60 to 70 percent, are in academic programs. So the strong results that we're getting back in terms of things like uh, faculty members, uh, quality lectures, program organization, good teachers, uh, and so on and so on. Um, these are students in class with Canadian students who are also um, you know, getting the benefit of having small class size, very good lectures, uh, and so on. So uh, we're, we're hoping that as sort of an offshoot that that will also help us not only in international but in domestic, um, domestic marketing. And, and one other thing that you touched on that I think is really important um, in terms of the, the challenges you mentioned, and how, how ISB can help for point number three about the power of internationalization is hard to wield, um, but using it to highlight peer, uh, peers or areas within the college. 
Um, this year, after well, both years, in fact, after the results were announced and we had done very well, we had um, a college-wide celebration and acknowledged those specific areas to say thank you, faculty. Look at uh, you know we came out number one in the world for quality lectures and good teachers. Um, you know, thank you, uh, IT support. We came out one in Canada and two in the world for IT support. Uh, thank you to our home state no. families for accommodation. You, you know, we we rank very highly for accommodation quality. So I, I think those. I kind of think it's important to then to then use them or use them strongly and work in other areas uh, that are not ranked quite so highly. Okay, no, that's great. So uh, we have about ten minutes left, and I want to just go through some some examples of the big data that I referenced earlier, and that picks up on a couple of the points that both Jeff and Virginia made in terms of international student scale and also international student diversity. And there's definitely patterns that we see in the data that don't explain all the variation in terms of satisfaction or recommendation, but they definitely explain a big chunk. So some of the cautions that you heard from, uh, from Virginia about diversity rather than over-enrolling from one or two countries. And then the difference, say, between a very small institution and a small intimate student experience, and then the challenges of scale. You want to take advantage of that and grow, but then does that undermine the very experience that got you there in the first place? These are important issues, I think, that, again, working with something like the ISB can help an institution track over time and try and control for, anticipate these kind of changes. So I'm going to show you some data uh, that is a, actually a mix of college and university data, because we've recently done some uh, university-specific analysis, and I added the, some Canadian college data to that, just, just to uh, show you some contrast. So I'm going to show you three different slides. This one contrasts the number of international undergraduates by institution. Each diamond represents an institution, about 60 in all. And then among international undergraduates, overall satisfaction with their experience. And just to orient you to the scale, the uh, vertical scale, four, a score of four would mean all students were very satisfied. A score of one would mean all students were very dissatisfied. So the three mark is basic satisfaction. And you can see here uh, there seems to be a relationship between scale and satisfaction. Essentially, in general terms, the more international undergrads on campus, and this is both for universities and colleges across four different countries, the lower the satisfaction becomes. Now, it's not a perfect correlation. The, the, uh, the R2, the, the expression of correlation here is 0.33, so essentially explains a third of the variation, but two-thirds is unexplained, and you'd expect that. We've got multiple variables, students, faculty, departments, nationalities, you wouldn't expect a very, very high correlation on something as complex as this. So I think the fact that we have 0.33 is actually uh, pretty telling that scale does make a difference, meaning that without attendant care and attention to managing scale, managing the fruits of, of demand, an institution does risk a weakening experience and then all the all the potential for poor feedback, uh, questionable brand, all the rest of it. Now the red diamonds are Canadian colleges. So you can see very much fit the pattern. So you've got small schools including the likes of College of the Rockies, small numbers of international students definitely fit the pattern. Uh, low numbers, very high satisfaction. As the numbers increase in general you see that satisfaction going down. But, as the title says, scale is not destiny. There are things individual institutions do or don't do that really make a difference. So, for example, that institution, one of our Canadian colleges, definitely bucks the trend. They have an above average number of international students, even across the universities sampled here, but they have a very competitive overall satisfaction average. So, there are things that particular institution is doing that may or may not show up on the ISB itself. The ISB gives a certain amount of detail and nuance, but beyond that, we need to have conversations with individual 
managers, staff trying to understand cultural issues, organizational issues, leadership issues that can make a big difference. And the ISP, I'm very keen for the ISP to begin to add that dimension as well so we can in fuller form explain satisfaction as well as report differences between institutions. So this slide to say everybody wants to scale up, everybody wants more international students, but without care and attention, there's definitely a weakening of the experience and then a risk of the brand being weakened at the same time. Another comparison, and this is to Virginia's point about diversity. So this is contrasting two different things. Along the horizontal axis, the for any non-Western nationality, just to use a shorthand term, the greatest proportion of a single nationality, non-Western single nationality among international undergraduates. So, for example, 40% of undergrads come from China or 50% come from India or whatever the country might be, but it's typically one, of, one, or, one, or, one or two of those countries. And then the other axis is looking at international undergrad satisfaction with making friends with students from other countries. So not domestic students and not students from their own country, but other international students. And you can see again about a 0.4 correlation between, negative correlation between the scale of that non-Western dominant nationality, the higher that ratio gets, the weaker the satisfaction with integration, which, which makes sense. There's, in relative terms, fewer nationalities. Those nationalities outside the dominant group or two are much smaller. Among the dominant nationality, there's more of a tendency to remain within that group. There's some comfort there and also just some inevitability about it given the scale. So again, this I think is very helpful caution to schools where Chinese demand or Indian demand seems insatiable and it seems like a good idea at the time to recruit as many as you can possibly get. But again, there's, a, there's consequences to that. There's value in diversity, there's value in balance. And yes, you can pick up that kind of intelligence anecdotally, locally, but to see it here across four different countries, across over 60 different institutions, across universities and colleges, explaining 40% of the variation, that tells you there's really something substantial going on here. There's, there's, there's variables at work that are almost institution neutral unless the institution really anticipates them and acts upon those implications. So third one I want to show you, uh, similar to the first one, but it's focused on academics. So this is looking at the proportion of undergrads, international undergrads, or the proportion of all undergrads that are international, and then satisfaction with lectures, which college or university is still the typical undergraduate go-to pedagogical device. Depends on the field of study, depends on the institution, but in most cases it's pretty fundamental. And again, you see a negative relationship here explaining about, point, about a third of the variation. The higher that international ratio gets, the weaker the satisfaction with lectures, implying, I think, that bigger numbers, less interaction, more transmission pedagogy, less opportunity for students to ask questions, check understanding, less opportunity to interact between domestic and international students, faculty perhaps resorting to lectures because of increased scale and perhaps not being fully apprised of the uh, changing demographics each fall as international numbers increase. So again, to be able to stand back and see cross-institution, cross-country, this, this trend, but also again, outliers. There are institutions, that's a university, that's a college, where something's definitely bucking the trend. Uh, the institution's managing to achieve an above average satisfaction level when it comes to lectures despite having a higher than average uh, international undergrad ratio. So none of this, again, none of this is destiny, uh, scale necessitates X, but it's more saying that without necessary care and attention, uh, planning, innovation, then there is some inevitability about 
these kind of negative correlations. Now, uh, I'm conscious of time. We're already just, just past the hour. Uh, I think I know people have other things to get to. Just a, one last comment. We put out a couple of reports this year. Uh, they're more focused on the US and other countries so far. But just so you have a sense that we are next going to produce a Canada-specific report looking at our Canadian university partners data, our Canadian college partners data, compare it to US data, UK data, Australian data, really start to roll up the ISB and extract some of these big picture insights, big data insights that simply aren't available from any other source. So uh, very happy to share those with you that you see on the screen and then do look out for that Canadian report. We'll certainly be sharing it with our clients and publicizing it more widely towards the end of the year. Main event though, if your institution has, uh, if your interest has been piqued by what you've heard from me, what you've heard from your peers, please do get in touch. There's still time to participate in this fall's ISB and uh, we'd love to hear from you, give you more specifics, understand logistics, understand cost, understand timing. Uh, do get in touch uh, with one of us, the contact details you see there and we'd love to talk more uh, with you about that. So thanks to Virginia and Jeff, thanks to everyone who joined us in the audience and uh, we look forward to further conversations. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.